Welcome back everybody. In this video I'd like to address a detail regarding the relationship between velocity gradients and the rate of deformation. You may remember from a previous video when we talked about Newton's law of viscosity we introduced this parameter called the the strain gamma and the strain rate gamma dot and I told you that this quantity can represent deformations and rates of deformations in a material and that this is more of a general way to express uh, deformations and rates of deformations uh, as compared with the velocity gradient and, and the question came up are these equal is the velocity gradient equal to this uh, strain rate and I told you that well they're not exactly equal they're related so for the case of a simple shearing flow like I showed you in the past where we have fluid between two plates and one of them is sliding uh, at some velocity V and the other plate is, is stationary that's a, a purely shear driven flow and so in that case then this this equality holds the velocity gradient uh, is equal to the shear rate or the strain rate but uh, in general they're not exactly equal uh, but they are related and so in this video I wanted to try to clarify that question and and show you that what the relationship is uh, without hopefully getting into too many mathematical details um, so there is a relationship between uh, uh, stress and, and deformation as we know uh, we've thought of it uh, in terms of Newton's law of viscosity uh, basically uh, in terms of the velocity gradients as shown here but uh, in general it is expressed in terms of the strain rate uh, and in general uh, remember that stress is a tensor quantity because it depends not only on the direction of the force but also the orientation of the surface so in general uh, this would have you know nine components so we have a stress tensor and that's equal to the rate of deformation which is also a tensor quantity and it turns out that this uh, rate of deformation tensor is actually the symmetric part of the velocity gradient tensor so it's not exactly equal to the velocity gradient but it's equal to some component of it and the question then is why why is it not equal to the velocity gradient or, or what's the nature of this relationship between stress and deformation uh, in general to try to explain this I'm going to present an argument based on equilibrium of torques applied to a small actually infinitesimally small element of fluid uh, which is denoted here by this uh, by this box so I'm looking in two dimensions uh, X and Y axes and I'm looking at a small chunk of fluid uh, who's uh, denoted by the square which has a width Delta X and a height Delta Y this uh, CM uh, in the center uh, represents the center of mass associated with this fluid element and I've drawn some shear stresses uh, on these different surfaces so on the top surface I have uh, tau YX so remember that's because uh, the first index uh, represents the direction of the normal to the surface that the force is acting so the normal to this surface is in the Y direction and due to uh, force acting in the X direction uh, and on the right hand side I have tau xy because the normal to this surface is in the x direction and the force is in the y direction and so the top and the right uh, denotes the top surface and the right hand surface now I've also drawn some corresponding stress uh, stresses on the left side and the bottom side and I've drawn these arrows in directions that I've chosen because these uh, indicate positive uh, stresses now I haven't told you about the sign convention uh, why, how I know uh, to draw the arrows in this way to represent these as positive stresses uh, we'll cover that uh, in a later video where we talk about uh, the conservation of momentum uh, but for now uh, without getting into that detail you can just take my word for it that these uh, uh, that these are drawn these arrows are drawn in these directions such that they represent positive uh, quantities for the stress now I want to look at these torques uh, associated with these stresses on this fluid element and the sum of the torques you may remember from physics is equal to the moment of inertia times the angular acceleration remember the torque is force times distance to the axis of rotation uh, 
uh, I is the moment of inertia, and this omega dot represents the angular acceleration. And this is analogous to Newton's second law of motion, uh, which we know uh, F equals ma, or I guess more correctly, force. some of the forces is equal to the time rate of change in momentum. Uh, but th this is a similar, kinds of, uh, uh, similar kind of relationship uh, with respect to the torques. Now, I have stresses instead of forces, but the same relationship holds. Uh, per unit area. I can just divide both sides by the uh, unit area uh, on which the force acts and uh, that would cancel out basically. So uh, I don't have to worry about that and uh, consequently I can write the sum of the torques as follows. So I'm going to add up first uh, the left and the right hand side. So here I have tau xy on the left hand side plus tau xy on the right hand side times the distance to the axis of rotation, which is delta x over 2. And I know these are positive from the right-hand rule. So if I point my fingers in the direction of the, this uh, stress and sort of wrap them around, then my thumb would be pointing out of the, out of the screen. And, and the same goes for the, the stress on the left-hand side. So this, both of these are positive with respect to uh, the torque. Then uh, similarly on the top and bottom, I have these two uh, stresses or forces. Uh, force per unit area, and the distance to the um, axis of rotation is delta y over 2 for both of them. And then if I apply the right hand rule, I point my fingers in the direction of these stresses, then my thumb would be pointing into the screen. So I have a minus sign here. So this is the sum of the torques, and again I'm, I'm dividing both sides by the area, I'm sort of doing force per unit area. Uh, and that's equal to the moment of inertia times the angular acceleration. Now remember uh, from physics that the definition of the moment of inertia is uh, related to the integral of the mass distribution around uh, this associated with this shape about the center of mass and it's proportional to uh, the length squared plus the width squared, so delta x squared plus delta y squared. You can uh, check your physics book uh, to get uh, to see this relationship, but uh, this is the dependence. So since we're considering uh, infinitesimally small fluid element where delta x and delta y are small, if delta x and delta y are small, then delta x squared and delta y squared are very small. So what this says is because the left-hand side of this equation involves delta x and delta y, and the right-hand side involves delta x squared and delta y squared, then the right side, right-hand side of this equation goes to zero much faster than the left-hand side as in the limit of, of, of a small uh, fluid element. So basically the right-hand side uh, is, is essentially zero with respect to the left-hand side. Now, also, since we're talking about a very small piece of fluid, as delta x and delta y goes to zero, then the difference between the stress magnitude between opposing faces of the square is going to become negligible also. So essentially the stress on the left-hand side is going to become approximately equal to the value on the right-hand face, and similarly the value of the shear stress at the bottom face is going to be approximately equal to the value at the top face. There's not going to be uh, much room for change as the size of this fluid element becomes small. Also, uh, since we're talking about a, a square shaped element, uh, as these quantities become small, uh, we can say they're approximately equal. So uh, we can simplify then this, uh, this uh, sum of the torques uh, quite a bit because the sum of these left and right hand face stresses is equal to 2 tau xy and the sum of the bottom and top face is equal to 2 tau yx and delta x is approximately equal to delta y so these length scales cancel and if we solve this then we get basically that tau xy is approximately equal to tau yx in the limit of a, a small, uh, small size fluid element, a differential size fluid element as a consequence of this conservation of, of torques. So this indicates that the stress tensor is symmetric. If the stress tensor is, a, is a, a matrix with nine components and in terms of the, the linear algebra I guess the, the symmetric tensor is one where the off diagonal components are equal. So tau xy equals tau yx. So this is one example of that uh, at least for this 
this component of the stress tensor. But if the stress tensor is symmetric, since that's related to uh, this rate of deformation tensor by Newton's law of viscosity, then that implies that this, this uh, rate of deformation tensor also has to be symmetric. Okay, so how do we relate this to the velocity gradient tensor? Well, again, if you go back to the math, uh, linear algebra, any tensor can be decomposed into the sum of a symmetric component and an anti-symmetric component. And so this allows us to establish a relationship between this quantity, the rate of deformation tensor, and the velocity gradient tensor. And again, the, this can be shown uh, in, I'm not going to go into the details here, but it turns out that uh, this decomposition might look something like this. Uh, the velocity gradient tensor is equal to one half times the rate of deformation tensor, which is the symmetric component, and then this anti-symmetric component, which is known as the, the vorticity tensor. And you may or may not have this factor of a half here, it depends on how you uh, uh, how you define these terms, but uh, this is basically uh, what you end up with. And so notice that the velocity gradient can be composed into two different kinds of material behavior. We have the symmetric component which represents shearing motion or shearing deformations and this vorticity component which represents pure rotation. So this solid body rotation that's expressed by this anti-symmetric component actually doesn't contribute to the deformation of the fluid element. So that's why we don't consider this component of the velocity gradient in determining the shear stresses because it's just translation, solid body rotation. In order to establish the relationship between stress and flow, we're only uh, considering these symmetric components which represent uh, actual deformations. So getting back to Newton's law of viscosity as I presented it before, I presented a very simple case which was a purely shear driven flow. So in that case the velocity gradient tensor actually is symmetric. There is no solid body rotation for the simple shearing flow between two plates uh, that I've been showing uh, throughout these videos. So I posed a problem where I knew already that the velocity gradient tensor the vo or the velocity gradient and the shear rate or strain rate or deformation rate is equivalent for that kind of flow because the motion does not incorporate this solid body rotation term. So in that case they are equivalent. So I can write Newton's law for a simple shearing flow. But in general, um, I have to consider only the symmetric part of the velocity gradient tensor. So that's a detail that may or may not be important uh, at this point, uh, but I just wanted to present it in a, in a general way here so that you can understand this relationship. But if you go on to take a graduate level uh, transport or fluid mechanics, uh, you'll you know, consider this in more detail. Uh, but, but this is just the basic idea uh, to answer the question about how these stresses and deformations are related.